again at 3 a.m. I have a cheeky one or two. Really? And I fucking regret it the next day because I feel shit. So you can go to cigarettes and walk away from them whenever, as you please. It well, doesn't hook you. No, but like I know if I, like it's the thing. You know what the thing is? Like I always do it obviously when I'm having a big night. You know, I hit a point and I'm like, yeah, so let's just have a cigarette that I've bought it off someone. So I don't buy them. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'll give someone two bucks for a cigarette. I'm not a scumbag, but I, like... Yeah, you'll offer. I won't buy a packet of them because that would be... Is that too much of a commitment? I just reckon it's dangerous. Yes. Like, I've got no off switch. So I would just be like, oh, now I have cigarettes. Yeah. Like, let's do it. But, like, I love it at the time. As soon as I... I'm like, whoa. But then the next day I feel like shit. Absolutely. But at the time, I know what you mean. My weaknesses are the rollies, Port Royal rollies. All oh, right, yeah. yeah. Do you go tailored or do you don't care? Oh, like, I, I prefer tailored Now because I'm the... a soft cock, but like, yeah. And I can't roll them myself. I'm inept. Oh, you don't? Yeah. I enjoy the roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can imagine that. It's a ritual. Yeah, it's a ritual. Uh, anyway, we're recording. Cool, I yeah. figured that. Nikki Barry, everyone. Yay, thank you. First time I met you was uh, Kings of Comedy, and uh, I'd never seen you before. I just got back from London, and you were fucking crushing. And I'm like, what is this presence? It was, <laughs> it was fucking awesome to watch. You were emceeing the whole show. Oh, you yes. You were the backbone of the show, and they fucking loved you. And it was oh, so Oh, you were good. great too, though, because that was the yeah. first time I saw you. Yeah. Oh, first time we, you oh that was the first time we saw each other. Yeah. Oh, mwah. Yeah, <laughs> it was so much fun. And, uh, and then I was like, yeah, this chick's a crusher. Um, Thank you. She's awesome. And, um, yeah, so that's when I first met you. It was a while back. Um, and... If we can go straight into it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because I went and saw your show, Unbridled. Yes, thank you so much for coming. Well, I didn't realise you'd snuck in until after the show. Like, I did, as in, I didn't realise you were there at the time. Well, yeah. I wanted to come and see the show because uh, I went through an, a relationship for only eight years. Yeah. And when I came out of it, I'm like, I don't think I ever want to fucking do that again. <laughs> and when I read your blurb, it was 27 yeah, 27 years. or so years. 27 yeah. years of marriage. Yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, tell me, like, will you ever again or it has what, to be... What, get a- married? Oh, don't be fucking stupid. <laughs> no. <laughs> Anybody who's listening to this, don't fucking do it in the first place. <laughs> it's a ridiculous institution. It's a stupid construct, marriage itself. Like, no. But, uh, no, I have, um, I have no interest in actually having another, like, live-in relationship with someone. Like, you know, I would happily have another relationship with someone if the right person came around, I think. Yeah, but because this guy was a fucking arsehole. Because in your show, you said <laughs> what he was... Thank you! Yes! Well, only because you said he was uh, he was a Mr. Everything Man. He knew everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's like a massive sign. In the beginning, when your yeah. partner knows everything, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're yeah. like, fuck you. Yeah, well, you know, I, I was very young. I, yeah. And, um, and look, he did have some good qualities. <laughs> I probably didn't emphasise those in the show. And we had four kids together, you know, which is yeah. a huge thing. Like, you know, we were a family and we were, um, I think, happy together for a long time. But then when we weren't, we just really fucking weren't. Yeah. And... Um, One of the things that he said to me, I remember when we kind of split, was, um, you know, the you've changed thing. Yeah. And it's like, people grow, man. Yeah. You know, like, it would be pretty sad if I was the same person I was when I was 23 when we got together. Like, that would be... When he was saying you've changed, was that basically another way of saying um, you're no longer meeting my needs or not? Oh, I, I know, think, I think so. Um, I think that, um, cause I think it's, it's almost a form of abuse. Like you've changed as in, um, you're not pulling your weight or servicing me anymore. Well, y- or... yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't being the wife <laughs> that he wanted me to be anymore. Yes. Yeah. 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 Cause uh, you put uh, everything on, I think <laughs> something that made me laugh in the show, you said, uh, in the 90s, you were a baby factory. You just pumped them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, I spent the 90s. I, I know there was uh, Kurt Cobain, and that's about yeah. all I fucking remember of the 90s. Yeah. Seriously, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I popped them out. Yeah. And um, was was the bug stand up in the back of your mind? Like, would you come across stand up on TV and go, "Fuck, I'd love to do that one day," or it wasn't there yet? Oh, uh, I I have been a stand up fan forever. So I grew up in a household where my dad, in particular, my dad, um, was a really funny man. And from the time we were little, like, you know, uh, for your listeners, I'm uh, 55 years old, 35 on dating apps, but 55 in real life. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm kidding, I'm not on any apps. Um, <laughs> but so, um, we grew up watching all those, uh, especially British comedy, all those shows that would no longer, like, would be cancelled on TV now, you know, Love Thy Neighbour, um on the buses, all those kind of British sitcom shows and stuff, and also British stand-up shows that were on. So Dave Allen, who's actually Irish, but, um, you yeah, know, Dave there was Allen. a bunch of the two Ronnies, like people yeah. like that. My dad used to watch all of them, and we were also right into, we used to listen to The Naked Vicar Show, which was on ABC Radio originally, um, with Ross Higgins and Nolene Brown, fabulous Australian sketch comedy show. Um, and stuff like that. And um, so I'd always love stand-up. And I'm so fucking old that I went to the first Melbourne International <laughs> Comedy Festival, which was called the Spoleto Festival. And I've been to something at every comedy festival bar two. Only because, um, I, you know, I was popping out babies yep. the two years that I missed out on. So I always fucking loved comedy. Yeah. So when you went to the first stand-up comedy festival... Did you want to cross that line and get on stage, or was it just like I can't believe I'm here? This is so much fun. I want to enjoy. Oh, this. look, I loved I loved comedy, and um, I had a massive like fangirl crush on a particular comic, and so I used to like go to wherever. Not not like a, in a stalky way, but you know, like I'd go watch if like he was on a lineup. Who, like who I'd was go. That? Andrew, Andrew Godone, good, a good one. Oh, Andy. As he said, oh, yeah, loved him. Oh, he was a babe. He was an absolute fucking babe yeah. and funny. But him and, like, Tim Smith and Peter Rosethorn, you know, there was a bunch of them. There was occasionally a woman doing comedy listeners, just occasionally, <laughs> you know, when they were allowed on. Um, <laughs> you know, I remember Judith Lucy when she first started seeing her and just yeah. being like, fuck yes, like, she's amazing. I remember right Wendy Harmer as a kid. Wendy Harmer, was yeah. Was she a comic, a stand-up as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. She did stand-up. She did um, a great show on the... Uh, I think that was on ABC TV as the well. The big geek. Yeah, the big geek. Yes. Like, that was epic. That's what I grew up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, what made me yeah. watch it. Um, but yeah, I, like I was a, a punter for like forever. Yeah. Okay, so you don't know, do you know, you know the the moment it congealed where you were like, I have to do this? Only because I'm, I'm interested in people's journeys when they discover that they want to do stand-up. Me, I didn't know, but I, I gravitated towards the stand-up comedy section of Hey Hate Saturday. I gravitated towards the late show, the big gig, and I was yeah, so, yeah, focusing yeah. on stand-ups. But at that time, I didn't know I wanted to do stand-up. I wanted to interject with a witty remark every time I were around the dinner table. I was always searching yeah. for that punchline. Um, but I still didn't know I wanted to do it until Champagne Comedy on Channel 31 made me realise that, hey, it's fucking in Armadale. You can go and do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, no, well, I'm, you know, obviously I didn't start doing stand-up till I was like 48 years old. So, you know, a bit of a late bloomer. Oh, so you're fairly young in stand-up. Yeah. Yes, yes, you are, but, you yes, uh, yes. It's not stand up that's aged me. It's just <laughs> fucking life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck, I look great when I started. No, I didn't. I already look like this, Johnny. Imagine. Um, no, I. Uh, the reason I started stand up, honestly, is because yeah. um, I was that I was that person who would like. Uh, okay, so at high school, I was always the person fucking about and doing dumb shit with my best friend. Right, we went to a super strict. Catholic girls' school where you weren't allowed to do fucking anything. Yes, and the nuns. Yes, the nuns. And so me and my mate Louise, like, we were always the naughty girls down the back. We were always going to the principal's office. We were always getting called out over the PA for whatever, right? It was That was us. And we had the best fucking time. There. She actually got invited to leave the school at the end of year 10 because <laughs> they called us into the office and said, we can't keep both of you. And I was academically better than her. So, so, she, they, had yeah, so she had to go. And the thing was, like, dumb, mate, she up. was spewing at the time, but then she got to go to, like, fucking Essendon Tech. One, there was boys, no uniform, allowed to smoke 
at school, right? That's a lot of... I, I was fucking spewing, right? Yeah. I was like, damn, should have acted dumber. Um, but, I, and we were always um, together and separately, the people who would get up at parties and do stupid things, you know, dance on the table or just like pull some stupid prank or tell some stupid story and... I would go to friends' parties as we got older and be the person that was asked to make the stupid speech and, yep. you know, kind of clown around and make things fun. So I was always that person. Um, but I did stand up because I, so my friend Louise, short story, I'll, I'll make it short, died when she was 42. She had leukemia and, like, she was diagnosed with leukemia at 41, dead at 42. Um, and th- three or so years after she died, her husband had his 50th birthday mm. and I made the stupid speech at the party and at three o'clock in the morning, we're standing on the balcony, absolutely shit-faced and all of my friends that were there said to me, when are you going to go and do something about your comedy? You know, like you're really funny. That's great. Just go and do it. Because Louise and I always said, we thought we were going to be the next French and Saunders. Yeah, right. But we weren't going to work it at Johnny. We were just going to be discovered and instantly get a TV special. <laughs> we weren't going to have to do shit open mics. Yeah. I like how your friends said when. Yeah. And not why. Well, Because when it was like, were they pushing you to do it for yeah. a while. Well, yeah, they kept on saying to yeah. me, you know, and they used to come to comedy shows with me. Like, we'd always go to a few shows at festival and that. And they'd be like, I mean, it's easy when you're in the chair, isn't it? In the mm. audience to go, oh, I reckon you're funnier than that person. Um, but, and I'm not saying that I am funnier than any of the people we ever saw, but, it, you know, that thing about, oh, I think you should give this a go, right? And because I was drunk at three o'clock in the morning and I'm convinced that I'm fabulous at this point, I said to them, yeah, yeah, I'm going to enter raw comedy. So, like, I entered raw comedy. Like, that was November. So was that your first gig? Yeah, yeah. I'd never done a gig and I did raw. What a fucking idiot. But you made the state finals. Yes. I made the state finals too. Yeah, of course you did. But, you, well, that, I started around then as well. But I had, I was smart enough to do a few lead-up gigs. Yeah, no, well, I, I'm not you smart. Were... <laughs> I was just, no, because, you know, at the time I just went home and the next day or the next week or whatever, I just went online and, like, put my name down to do Royal Comedy and got yeah. an email saying, oh, yes, your heat's in February. This was November. Just went, sweet, and thought nothing of it until the end of January when I got another fucking email saying, reminder, your heat's next week. And I'm like, fuck. I don't know how to write five minutes of stand-up. So I don't know you, what to do. Really? Were you mulling over... Uh, you may not have put anything to paper, but were you mulling over routines or bits or premises in your head? Oh, yeah. well... Because yeah. that essentially is the writing process. Well, yes, it? the week beforehand, yeah, I was like, boy. fuck, 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 what's funny, what's funny, what's funny? How can I milk this? So I'll cram until the end. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then when I went to the like the first heat, it was fucking 43 degrees. We're at the, in the band room at the old East Brunswick Hotel, you know, yes, before they fucked before with they, it. Yep. Uh, yeah, the old stinky band room, mm. gorgeous. But, like, I was just there. I was number 36 on the fucking lineup. Wow. Great. <laughs> Out of 40 people. And, like, there's all these cunts there just walking around going, oh, I've never seen you before. I've done 100 gigs, blah, blah, blah. And in my head, I'm just like, I'm just like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, you idiot. But, like, I had 20 of my mates there. So it's like, you can't back out now. <laughs> They've okay. all come. They're all having a great time. So let me, if I can get, take you to that moment. Like, how yep. many people are we talking in the crowd? First gig ever. 100? Oh, it 40? was, that band room was packed. So, so I guess there was... You know, maybe 100, maybe 150 or something. I can't think about how many people would fit in that band room now. So it was chockers. So there's 100 people. You've never done a gig before. And what's going through your head? like (laughs) That I'm a fucking idiot. (laughs) 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 Pretty much. (laughs) How do you... Uh, so what happens to you? I get the nervous poos. I, oh, I, oh, okay. I, I, yeah, I fight or fr- flight or fright, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I shit myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, do you, and I pace and I can't contain, I can't have a conversation with someone backstage. It's difficult to yeah, go back yeah. and forth. Oh, look, now I'm, I'm, I think, very calm before a but show. At but, but at the time, no, I was shitting myself and I was pacing. Like yeah. I was right at the back of the room trying to get away from everyone else because you know there's also so much going on like Mm. there's the people the person who's up there doing the gig there's all the audience kind of chatting and coming Mm. back and forward getting beers and that there's my mates keep coming over to me going oh do you want to drink this and like they're having a because they're just there having fun right Mm. 
And I, yes, am in my own head and I am frantically pacing up and down the back of the room thinking, what the fuck did I think I was mm. doing when I signed up? Yeah. But it must have, uh, so you did really well because you made the state final. Well, <laughs> surprisingly, yeah. Did yeah. you Did you slip up or when you came off stage, did you think to yourself, fuck, um, yeah, I think maybe I could do something with this? No, well, well, I did that and the thing was, like I did it, I, I did the state final and honestly, the night of the final, I think I was... May, I was on fairly early. I think I was maybe number three or four. And I had like a really good set. Like I had a great time and the audience were fucking lovely. And um, I actually came off the stage feeling really good and for a <laughs> moment thinking, oh, you know what? Like, and I, I'm without being conceited, I was like, the th people who'd been on before me, I got way more laughs than them. Mm. So I was kind of like, fuck yeah. And then the next couple of people after me, Similarly, like, you know, I mean, everybody that's in the final is good. I'm not, you know, but but then <laughs> a dude named um, Khaled Kalafala got up there and fucking destroyed that space for five minutes. And you know that thing, you know, as a comic, <laughs> no, I, I reckon, yeah, right. like, if, you, so cool. if you're a decent person, you're there barracking for the person who's doing that, right? Like, mm. I am just there, like, full respect going fucking... Yes. Like, at the same time in my head, I'm going, I have got no hope of winning this now. Yeah. Because this guy, but it was next level fabulous. Isn't it, isn't it a joy to behold, And it is. Though? It is. It, it's special. I, I've seen that a couple of times in my life, and I saw it the last time. The, one of the memories that sticks out was Leeds. Uh, after the break, Gary Delaney. Right, yeah. He's a one-liner. And yep. the laughter just, just, yeah, next level is the best way to describe it. Just... This, the, the audience were just all as one, laughing at the same time, almost as if a conductor, and the laughs were booming. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It's it, yeah, it's glo it's absolutely fucking glorious, yeah. you know? So you walked away from that competition thinking, um, oh, shit, I think I'm hooked? No, I walked away from that competition and went, oh, well, I did that. You okay, know, so like I, I, so I kind of, I was like, okay, I proved something to myself and my friends. Like I did, I did comedy, you know, <laughs> and, um, and you know, I didn't suck at it. Right. So I was like, yay me. And then I had, um, a lot of things happen in my life. Like I, I changed jobs significantly and, you know, and got busy with stuff that was going on with my kids four and other stuff. Them. Yeah, four of them. That's times four. Yes, yes, yes. Like, imagine one and then multiply it, by fucking it, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, look, you ignore them more when there's more of them, really. <laughs> That's the truth. If there's one you feel that you've got to guide them through life, four of them, you're just like, fucking Feed them like pigeons. Off you go. You go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Catch and kill your own children. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so I waited for a couple of years and then it was only because I then I had that nagging thought about what if I really tried to do it, right? What mm. if I actually put some effort into it and actually tried to yes. do it? Um, and so I went back and I did Raw again because I still didn't know how to do comedy. Like, yeah. I didn't know anything about the scene really or I didn't know anyone who did it. Well, that's why Raw is fucking great. Yeah, so so I went and did Raw again and I only got through, um, I think I got to the semi-finals the second time around. But uh, it's that thing. I met one person. I had one person came up to me um, after one of those shows and um, and was lovely to me and said, oh, you know, I've, I've never seen you around. Where are you gigging and stuff? And I was like, I'm not gigging. And she was like, what do you mean you're not gigging? And I was like, well, I don't know anybody. I don't know what I'm doing. And she very kindly took me to some rooms and introduced me to some people and got me a couple of gigs. That's and awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> yeah. And so I got started. Yeah. And uh, just I don't, I'm going back a bit, but I'm just curious. Uh, for me, stand up is an ex extremely liberating experience. I feel really free afterwards. Like I've uh, gotten rid of a whole heap of shit. Even if I don't do too well, I'm like, that was great. Cause it was chaotic, and I feel free. It's liberating. Um, did that attract you more to stand up, seeing as like Mister Everything for 27 years was like inhibiting in some capacity? Like you said, you've changed and wasn't allowing you to change maybe not 
physically allowing you to change, but in terms of holding you back as a person to evolve and grow and maybe try oh, stand up? I, I think it, for me it was definitely like that thing about, you know, expressing all the weird fucked up <laughs> stuff that's Shit. going on in your head. And also yeah. because I do have like, you know, I, I think anybody who does comedy has that, um, you know, that voice that's constantly like yeah. you're taking in the world and but you're having a very different conversation with yourself about often what's going on rather than just narrating yeah. it in a straightforward kind of fashion there's all those tangents that Absolutely. are going off that's what i think anyway yes yeah, so you're in you're in professional employment right so, yes yeah, as, <laughs> still amazing as, <laughs> <laughs> my boss came to the show and i still did. have a job she yes oh that's that's awesome because I've got a new boss at work, and I was told at the pub. I work at a pub. I pull yeah. beers, but still, I was told um, by the lesser bosses, uh, "Rein in your humour. Let the boss get to know you first before." So, do you are you mindful at work of like the comedian, so you can mute the comic? <laughs> because um, we could get into a lot of fucking trouble with some great one-liners or comebacks. Oh, look, it's hard. I mean, the first thing is, uh, it, as you know, I'm quite a potty mouth. So I really have to dial it back when I'm at work because, you know, when I'm around comics and when I'm performing comedy, like not that I have to swear to be funny, but I swear a lot, you know, just in everyday conversation. So obviously I don't do that when I'm at work. But I've actually found like I'm a, I'm a community worker and so I'm often um, working with um, people who have a lot of issues going on in their lives, a lot of difficulties, a lot of social problems, you know, sometimes substance abuse problems, violence, all mm. sorts of stuff. And I actually find that um, kind of uh, prudent use of comedy and comedic skill when you're actually working with people who are going through really hard stuff is actually very effective. I mean, you've got to be, you know, selective uh, about it and tactful. Ca tactful and stuff. Yes. But it actually can really help to... Um, break down a communication boundary with someone or actually get someone to relax a little bit and be able to participate in the conversation or um, develop a little bit of rapport with you to help you to try and work with them and help them. Um, but it is a tricky thing. And the other thing is too, I mean, when you work in an environment where you around those sorts of people a lot, you know, as a worker, that can be very challenging and sometimes quite demoralising as well because, you know, you're seeing a lot of people whose problems you can't fucking fix. Yeah. Does that affect you after work as well? Like you take shit home? Oh, yeah, sometimes mm. it can. So once again, the use of humour with your colleagues to just sort of diffuse. cope with that. Yeah, and diffuse it a bit, I think is um, good. But, I mean, you do have to be a bit wary because, mm. yeah, and there is some times when, you know, something will happen um, at your workplace that... Like I love, I love comedy that's bleak. Like I love stuff that's about the bleak and the wrong and the dark and all that sort of stuff. And often there's, you know, stories that you come by through your work that you're like, "Fuck! I wish I could use this on stage." Like I can't because <laughs> it's, well, it's it's not my story, you know. And and it's also that thing about. I mean, I think whenever you use that sort of stuff on stage, social commentary, you know, it should be about like punching up. And or, you know, raising an issue in terms of this is fucked. You know, poverty is fucked. Homelessness is fucked, right? We shouldn't have homelessness and we can make, and I do tell a few jokes. I've done a lot of work with homeless people about homeless uh, circumstances that have happened between me and homeless people, but it's not hanging shit on the homeless person. It's actually about this is a fucked up situation mm. and, you know, and this happened as a result of that fucked up situation. So, yeah, I think it just, you know, takes some thought. Yep. Yeah. Um, wh what do you think of the stand-up scene now? Are you, as opposed to when you first, maybe, not when you first started, but when you were exposed to comedy, do you think it's uh, at a great place right now, like the evolution of stand-up? Uh, not in this country, no. No? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I think, well, I think it's a shame that, you know, I think many of the best com uh, comics that you and I no, in this country, are never going to be able to afford to make their living from stand up because of the way the industry operates here. Yeah. Um, and I, I also think that, um, you know, people, the general public are spoon fed such a narrow view 
of what comedy is by mainstream media and stuff. You know, like, and and I say this with no disrespect to the people who are at the top of the comedy ladder in inverted commas in terms of people who are signed and got management and on tally and all that sort of stuff. I mean, they're talented people and they work fucking hard at it. Yeah. But they're a very, um, very kind of, in some ways to me, homogenous yeah. group in terms of what they do and how it's done. And you and I can both think of a lot of people in this country who really continue to create really interesting stuff and, you know, blur lines and do things quite differently and, you know, challenge comedy in a way in terms of what they're doing and, you know, they're nameless and faceless to, you know, so many people because they just don't get a go. Yep. I agree. I've often described it to friends as like a supermarket with a specific range of products. Yes. Not much yes, range. Yes, that's, really, you know. that's a really good way to put it, I think. And uh, I have friends ask me, who should I go see in the festival? And I cherry pick a few acts. And yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. check them, these out. Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, that's a, a perfect example. You know, comedy festival, it's like, um, I'm the same. I'll say to people, look, if you've got someone who you're a massive fan of and you're actually fanging to see their show who's a big international act or a big you know national act good on you go see them but then <laughs> you know here's half a dozen people that I would highly recommend you go and see who are not people that you've probably ever heard of but fuck yes and you know 99% of the time that person will come back to me and go oh my god that was amazing it's like yeah 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 um one thing that made me laugh, well, no, I, I just, I had no idea, but um, you went to the hospital and they asked you, I don't know why you went to the hospital, it's not important, but they asked you what your marital status was. I know, that was just you, a few weeks ago and, and I lost went, my shit. You lost your shit on <laughs> Facebook, going, what the fuck does it have to do with anything? Yeah, exactly. And I was like, fuck, she's right. And a few times you've done that. Uh, on your show, I've seen it when you... Uh, you that you've made me see things from another perspective. And I'm like, yeah, she's right. What does it have to do with anything regarding what's going on with your body or your <laughs> yeah, health? Yeah, 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 yeah. Whether you're married or not. Yeah. Um, that just, yeah. Did, did they understand that when you conveyed that to the nurse or? Well, at the time, I, I don't think so, like in terms of, you know, but, but it, it was just that thing. So, yeah, I went to the hospital. I was having some routine tests done. So I was at the radiology department and I had an appointment and I just walked up to the desk and was like, hey, I'm here for my appointment. And they were like, right. And, you know, they just go through the rigmarole, name, address, date of birth, and I'm chanting them off, you know, and do I have COVID, you know, because I've got to ask those questions at the moment. So they go through all of that. And then she said to me, oh, and can I just confirm your marital status? Yeah. And I said, I beg your pardon. And she said, oh, I need to confirm your marital status. And I was just like, why? And she was like, oh, because we do that with everybody here. And I was just like, yeah. I used to work in public health. Yeah. So I was like, well, no, that's not, you know, it's got nothing to do with why I'm here and it makes no difference. It's not answering the question, is it? She's just no. going, it's, it's a routine question. And I understand because afterwards I actually had, um, like I put a bit of a rant on Facebook people about <laughs> it. And I, my favourite bit about it actually was after I'd done my little rant at the desk, I went and sat down in the waiting room and this old guy that was sitting there um, le leant over to me and was kind of, um, he was kind of like, oh, because oh, I finished my rant with, if you must know, I'm divorced, right? And sa and then I sat down in the waiting room and then this old guy just leaned over and goes to me, I bet your ex-husband's terrified of you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I fucking hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then, you know, like later on that night, like I put it up on Facebook and then I had a friend of mine, a Facebook friend of mine who works in public health said to me, she goes, oh, it's actually something stupid that the Department of Health and Human Services ask hospitals to collect that as a statistic. It's a bit like, you know, they're meant to ask you if you identify as being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander yep. when you go to a public health service, right? Yep. And, um, health services don't seem to understand why it's fucking stupid to ask that question because a lot of um, people who identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander do not want to 
out themselves yes. at the desk of a public hospital. Wow. Because they're concerned about um, how they'll be perceived or how they'll be treated, or especially for women, they're worried that if they've turned up to hospital, welfare is going to be on the door to pinch their kids. Ah. Yeah, no, it's true. Holy so shit. it's so it's like, and no matter how many times I participated in conversations with services about that, they were like, oh, no, but we need the statistics. And it's like, fuck. And, you know, people don't seek health care treatment when they need it because they don't want to be asked. Mm. You know, stupid. Anyway. Mm. Um, are you happy with the direction of the way um, women are moving in stand-up? <laughs> Do you think that's enough? Are we moving? <laughs> <laughs> no? No? Um, look, no, because... So here's the thing for me. I mean, I'm pleased that there are more women and non-bloke comedians that are getting up there and in and mm -hmm. getting a go to some point. But I think the thing that infuriates me is that for change to really happen, it's like anything else. It's like it's not just up to the women to make the change. It's actually up to the industry as a whole to yep. make the change. And, and you think they're not doing enough? Well, have you ever had a bloke, I, I, I mean, have you ever been on a lineup that's all men and heard a bloke go, oh, hang on a minute, like, this doesn't look right? No. 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 There you go. Yeah. Answers the question. Yes. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I've, I realize I'm a product of a particular generation. Like, before when I asked you, your boss, you corrected me by saying, it's a she, not a he. Yeah. But I spat out he. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I yeah. think that's like, why did I say he? Because I think I was raised. Yeah, that the bloke was going to be the boss. Yeah. But I think that's slowly changing. Oh, it, it definitely and is. I think it's moving in a good, I think it's 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 like you got to steer a ship, right? you got to slowly move it in the right, you can't just make change overnight. It's got to happen oh, gradually. <laughs> um, no, you could not, uh, yeah, retort. But yeah, I mean, you could, I mean, you know, sudden change has fallout as well. So, you know, there's fallout no matter what way you try and make change. And there are some people, you know, in any uh, area of life that are absolutely wedded to a particular ideal or a particular day, way of doing things and are going to dig their heels in and be bloody minded and insist you know, this is the right way that, or this is the way we've always done it. This is tradition. You know, we hear tradition being used as a reason for things all the time, which is fucking stupid. Yeah. Well, what are they afraid of? I, I don't know what they're afraid well, of. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't know either. And, you know, the thing is with stand-up, I mean, at the end of the day, you fall on your sword, right? Because you're either fucking funny or you're not. Mm. Like, that's the litmus, that's the only rule of stand-up. Yeah. Be funny. Yeah, like, let anyone scale Everest <laughs> so, if they can make yeah. it. So, good luck to you them. know, um, give people some space, see how they go, and the audience decides. You know, if if you've got an audience and, and they're digging what you're doing, they're laughing, that's what you want. If they're not, okay, then, you know, go back and work at it and get better or don't get up there. Like, that's that's how that should work for everyone. But it's about, you know, making sure that everyone who wants to get up there, can get up there. That's the bit that's sometimes still missing. Have you ever felt uncomfortable up on stage, looking out at a room thinking, oh, fuck, here we go. Have you like, oh, fuck you, actually. <laughs> I am funny. Um, Give me a chance. Like, I, I've been very lucky. I've never had a hostile audience and I've never had... Um, <laughs> so far, she says, touching wood, because well, it's always the first time... Um, I've never had like an absolute bomb to silence. Like I've I've had you know plenty of times when I haven't done as well as I wanted to and all that sort of thing, or where I've fucked up a punchline or you know yeah, whatever. Yeah, sure, sure. But I've never had you know that god awful absolute like just fucking get her off. <laughs> this is terrible. You've never had a complete and utter bomb. No, not yet. Fuck. But but it's coming. Uh, and yeah. imagine it's going to be really spectacular. I've probably mozzed myself. It's probably coming t oh God, tomorrow. I'm, I, I'm, I'm emceeing a show tomorrow. You watch, I'll fucking die. No. Um, but, you know, um, no. The, the only thing, when I first started stand-up, I guess the thing for me was that, you know, like I would turn up to gigs and like... 
you know, because it's mainly young dudes that you're on with, especially when you're doing open mic as a yeah. newbie. It's yeah. mainly young dudes. And so, you know, those young dudes were as young as my kids yeah. <laughs> and sometimes younger. Um, and so sometimes I would get the, like, no one would kind of talk to me because it's kind of like, who bought their mum? Why is she in the green room? <laughs> <laughs> you know, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it would be, and the other thing I guess is, and you'll appreciate this, my comedy, I think to some degree, you know, I'm just a kind of nondescript looking middle-aged woman, right? So my com, what comes out of my mouth <laughs> doesn't necessarily match, yes. you know, the mumsy kind of looking vibe that yeah. is me. So, you know, that takes people a back. It does, yeah. Um, and it's fucking awesome. And I know that, and I use it as a wet, like I use it to my advantage yes. all the time. I play with, I play that up a lot. You know that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But. Especially the, if your word economy is efficient and you're just fucking getting straight to the punchlines, the, the audience hasn't got time. Yeah, to yeah. To just take a breath. They're just fucking laughing and losing um, it. But, you know, the, the young boy comics, it'd be like, they'd be sitting there and I'm sure they'd be thinking, oh, fuck, you know, this is going to be ordinary. And then it's like mm. when you get up there and you're not ordinary and you also, you know, take on subject matter that they weren't expecting, um, then it's interesting to see what happens because you kind of got have got the guys who are kind of like, hey, that was really cool, you know, like, or loved your jokes or, you know, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. And then you've got the ones that are just kind of like, oh, um, now I don't know what to do with that. You know, like, <laughs> or, you know, fuck, she didn't suck. Damn, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, right. But that's on them. They're fucking idiots. Yeah, no, no, I, I'm agreeing. And I'm not saying there's heaps of that or anything, but it, it's just, you know, it's interesting when you first start, like, trying Absolutely. to make your way in. Yeah. Now are you comfortable? Now do you see yourself as, um, w wouldn't you love it if all the bill is like little skinny white dudes and then you come along as someone completely different and the audience is going, oh, we've got a delicacy here. Someone completely different. I, this no, is well, going to be I, interesting. I, I've, like, I fucking love it. And I yes. do use it to my advantage because, yes. you know, often you are sort of the token vagina on a lineup still. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, um, and I'm kind of like, fucking yes. Because I'm like, this is the other thing that blokes don't understand. They do themselves a disservice. you got 10 blokes on a lineup. Mm. You're doing a disservice to the lineup. Yes. Because uh, by the time you get to bloke four or five, and I'm not saying this disrespectfully, because every bloke on that lineup will be different as a comic, but in the audience's mind, it's like, oh yeah, there was just, oh yeah, there was, you know, another dude. Oh, you know, we, we have the joke in comedy, you know, there was Dave, then there was Dave, then there was Dave. Yeah. But, but you know, that kind of stuff. Sure. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, but like, being that kind of, you know, that one, that token is actually, if you're strategic about it, is incredibly good because also no one else is going to talk about their vagina while they're up there yeah. or whatever. <laughs> I am, listeners. <laughs> going to talk about it a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so change, can be, change, in your opinion, can happen overnight. It can happen quicker. I said it could be slower. Only because I'm referencing it to... Uh, I worked for a comedy chain in London called Jonglers. Yep. And the running joke was, in the green room, if there were two black comics or two women, the booker fucked up. And, <laughs> yeah. and double booked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this was 2000, 2012. Yeah. So now almost 10 years later, um, it's turned a bit now. Uh, you can have... You know, a couple yeah, of blacks. Yeah, on two the, brown people. Yeah, oh, my God, bill, imagine. Oh, my God. And, uh, and, and some women acts as well without. So, yeah, but you think, no, it can be quicker. We can do things quicker. Well, I think, there, you know, there are a lot of rooms now that do have a much more balanced lineup in terms of, you know, that diversity yep. kind of thing. And they're doing really well. You know, there's an order. Because the other thing we forget is, you know, Australia overall in our lifetimes, I mean, I know you're a little bit younger than me, but we're kind of, you know, yeah, at similar. the more mature end of comedy, yes. um, of the comedy community, um, you know, we've seen the diversity, you know, especially in this part of Australia, like just explode, right? Yeah. And so that's the other thing that, you know, room runners, like if they're not on board with, you know, your audience is a, a bag of licorice all sorts usually. Mm. So it's kind of like yeah. reflect that in who you're 
who's up there. Yes. Um, you know, half your audience is, you know, female and or, you know, females and others, not blokes. So it's kind of like, why would I want to, why would I want to go and see 10 blokes do stand up? Mm. No fucking reason at all. Mm. You know, some diversity on the lineup. I'll pay my money. I'll come along. I'll buy my drinks. I'll have a good time. Mm. Yep. No. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm. Are you happy with your stand up at the moment where it's going? I'm a bit. One week I'm happy. One week I'm sad. One week I'm happy. <laughs> one week I'm sad. Usually when I'm sad, I might write something. And then I'm like, uh, philosophical about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did I have to be sad to write something funny? <laughs> yeah. Is that the roller? <laughs> is that the roller coaster? I'm on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, look, I think you know the last year and a half has been incredibly hard for us all because it's stop, start, stop, start, stop, start, isn't it? So you just can't kind of. How has that affected you? I've seen a running joke on your Facebook that you're off to the bottle or. <laughs> I'm always off to the bottle darling. <laughs> I've been off to the bottle since 1981. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> well, that's what happened. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> um, I went to the bottle during last lockdown. What I noticed with the last lockdown, lockdown number five, by the way, uh, I lost my motivation and my ambition for certain aspects of my career goals. And I just did shots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because um, I was like, we're gonna. What's the point of booking a gig in September? Because it might be lockdown six. Fuck yeah, it. I mean, I, w- I was disappointed in as much as like I was, um, you know, I was booked to go to Tassie and do some gigs, and then you know, lockdown four happened, and I had to like cancel all of that. Mm. And you know, I was really excited about. It's always, I, I reckon it's always fucking exciting to get on a plane and go in. <laughs> We can vaguely remember that. But I was really yeah. looking forward to kind of like, oh, this would be nice. It's nice to, you know, I've only like gigged in Tassie once or twice before. So it was kind of like, oh, this is going to be, yeah. you know, great. And that kind of, you know, then that dissipated and it's kind of like, and it's, you know, like, oh, you know that Tasmania is still going to be there and, you know, you'll get back there eventually. But it's kind of like, oh, again, here we go, here we go. You know, we managed to shoehorn in the unbridled show, which I'm so happy we did now because yeah, yeah the first one, the first run was cancelled. Well, well, we'd cancelled it like three times already. Oh, really? Yeah, we were meant to do it for May last year. Oh, fuck! So you know, this and that and the other thing. So, um, and you know, comedy festival like Lucy and I did a show together for comedy festival, which we only did a tiny run. We did three shows, different show, um. And we'll do more with that too, but it was kind of like not the same as doing like a full festival, you know, a decent festival run. I mean, I did heaps of spots during festival. I got around, yeah. but you know, festival kind of wasn't quite the same either yeah. for me. Um, so yeah, I think um, I probably life was very different also too, because usually I'm, very busy like I've still got like my youngest son has a disability he lives with me so you know there's just him and me now but you know between organizing his life working full-time and doing stand-up fuck you've got your plate full. my days are usually wow. long and very busy and all of a sudden you've got all that time because I'm working from home at the moment yeah. so there's no commuting you know you just can sit around in your pajamas all day and do your job which is kind of cool do you proportion time for a creative process where you can sit down and write or think, or do you just uh, like look at, do you just have a comic ear, so to speak, throughout the day looking for things? In uh, yeah, I'm much, I'm much more, yeah, I'm much more beat. I don't write. None of my material's written down. So yeah, great. Like either, I, either do I. Yeah, and I feel good about that. Every time I see another comic that says I don't really write either. Yes. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, so you have an idea and you riff on it on stage. Usually what I do actually is I'll have a, you know, a thought and it could be, you know, it's that thing like situationally you're on a tram, something stupid happens and you go, fuck, that was yeah. funny. Or, you know, you have a weird encounter with a stranger, you know, in a shop or on the phone or, uh, you know, my mum is a constant source of material for me. I'm sure you've read some of my Facebook posts yep. about my mum um, or, you know, my, my fucked my fucked upness with relationships and life or, you know, being a woman of a certain age, all those 
things that I draw upon for my My favourite one is fitting a kebab into a handbag. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> legend! <laughs> Consuming it the next afternoon for lunch. Gold. Fucking legend. <laughs> that was after I went to Dirty Secrets to do a spot, have one glass of wine and go home. That was my plan yes, when I went yes. to Dirty Secrets and then I <laughs> disappeared into that black hole. Um, but no, so I tend to, you know, have a bit of an idea that will just yep. pop into my, or come into my head somehow and I'll kind of churn that round and round in my head while mm. I'm doing whatever. Yeah. But I actually visualize. Do you think out loud? Oh, no, sorry, I cut you off. No, you no, visualize. no, not at all. I visualize myself performing the bit. So I don't, I don't write the bit down, but I actually visualize myself. And the thing, one of the things I think about stand-up that I find, I found interesting when I got into it, rather than just watching it as a punter, but actually started doing it myself. I don't spend much of my time outside of gigs watching comedy, like online or stuff. Like, I know a lot of comics spend hours and hours watching everyone's Netflix special and stuff on YouTube and whatever. I don't do that. I, I go and watch... I love uh, live performance of lots of other sorts. So I go and watch a lot of dance, a lot of theatre, a lot of live music, really? stuff like that. Well, I think a lot of comics fail to understand that, you know, comedy is only so much of it is about the words, but there's everything else. You know, are you animated on stage? Are you still? Are you, you know, kind of conversation? Like, what's your body language like on stage? What do you look like? Because when you are walking up there, the audience is already making decisions about you based on what you look like. You know, because most communication is not verbal. It's actually visual. And so it's all that sort of stuff. So it's not enough t for me to write something down, read it and go, oh, yeah, that's funny, right? It's actually about, okay, how am I going to communicate that to my audience, right? And I, um, you know, I pull a lot of faces when I'm on stage. I move around, like, because all of that is part of delivering your material. And a lot of comics don't realise that. You know, and it's the same as so many comics. You know, we know them. They get up on stage looking like a bag of shit. And it's like, okay, if that's your vibe and you want that to sort of, if that's part of what you're presenting and you want people to think that, you know, that's me and this is, it feeds into my material, fine. But that otherwise it's like the audience put on pants and caught an Uber and came to see you, whether they've paid for a ticket or not, right? They've come to see you, so fucking give them something to look at, hmm. you know. And I'm not saying that you need to be like, you know, because I'm not a, I'm not glamorous. I'm, but, but it's like, you know. No, I totally fucking get it. It's just how you present yourself. Yes, it's it, this is your performance. This is how you encapsulate everything and about also, your performance. And also, you know, look like you're in charge when you're up there, even if in your head you are fucking freaking out, going. I can't remember my lines or this stuff's new and I don't know if it flies or I just had a fight with my boyfriend or whatever is going on in your head. It's like when you get on there, you know, take command of that space mm. and it makes a very big difference. You've got to create that energy when you get up there so that people will listen to you. They, you want people to lean in, yeah. you know, not, le not lean back or turn away. Yeah. Yeah. Do you not watch comedy because it, uh, sorry, do you not watch comedy on TV or streaming services because you're afraid it will taint your creativity, lead you astray, give you all these ideas that you don't, that you may come across yourself later on um, or steer you in an, a certain direction? No, I, I think it's more just about, um, this is a sad thing to say, but I think it's just about like, um, I just don't find a lot of it exciting. Like in terms of, I think when I'm watching other comics, I'm constantly thinking about what I'd do with that. Yes. You know, so if they're live. There's no, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this question. No, no, it's no. It's just how we go about yeah, being who exactly. we are. So if, if, you know, and it's that thing too. It's a bit like watching sport on TV, which I don't watch at all, by the way. Like I'm not into, I'm really not into sport at all. Surprise. If you could see me now, you'd all be nodding. Um, <laughs> but it's like, you know, watching something on TV. Like I can get why, you know, some sports are, 
exciting, you know, in terms of their fast paced and there's action and there's, you know, a bit of violence or whatever, like it's, uh, but uh. it's, yeah, a uh, bit of biffo. <laughs> um, but, you know, like to go to the footy live, you know, or whatever, there's that atmosphere, there's that audience, there's oh, all of the drama and I the see. thing. And, you know, and like live comedy is the same because it's like the fucking Coliseum, right? Because it's, it's multi, like, multi are they, are they going to get mauled by the lion? <laughs> is, is the person who's up there going to fucking die <laughs> or yeah. are they going to survive? It is. It's like the Coliseum, right? It totally is. And the punters, like, if they don't dig you, like, they're fucking going to celebrate you dying. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, especially, you know when you see a comic who turns on the audience and gets really fucking nasty? Absolutely. You know, where's and, my popcorn? <laughs> you know, and you're kind of like, ooh, ooh, ooh yay. Love it. You know, there's two thoughts that go through your head. One is, thank fuck that's not me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and hopefully and you've been on before them yeah. so you don't have to deal with the aftermath. Yeah. You know, if you're emceeing, you're like, fuck you, cunt. Like, just, yeah, mop and bucket. Yeah, just fucking <laughs> shut up. But otherwise, it's kind of like, hello, yeah. bring it on. You yeah, know? it is great. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, I uh, if I'm ha- if I said this on another podcast, if I had the choice, I would much rather see. I know this sounds crazy to some people, but I would rather go to open mic than go see someone like Husey. No offense to Husey, because I love him. Do a polished show because I I might learn something. I'll, I'll learn a lot more from open mic. Yeah, because I'll see ideas that miss the dartboard completely, and I'll know how to. Hit the, I think I'll work out how to hit the dartboard. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll see what you just described. I'll see a, a great new emerging talent. Absolutely, yeah. It's the whole kit and caboodle, you know? Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and, and that is akin to going to the footy mm. rather than just watching it on tally. Yeah. So you see all these other things. So I get that. That's a beautiful way of, yeah, describing it. Um, we've got Brunny coming up. Yeah. Um, are you on tonight? No, no, no. I just want to, like, I haven't been to the Brunny since March. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I'm just going to go watch the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's one of my favorite rooms. Oh, it's lovely. Yeah. I do miss the old Brunny though. Yeah. Fuck, that was good. What happened? Did someone crash into a hydrant? S- somebody hit the fire hydrant. <laughs> While someone was on came, stage? Or? Yeah, came, no, no. Came around the corner. No, the pub was actually shut. Like oh, right. three or four in the morning. Okay. Hit that fire hydrant outside. Sent the water and because it's such an old building like it just the massive water damage to the property but i reckon they're going to turn it they'll turn that into apartments some developer it's right on that corner it is it's yeah you can smell prime real estate real estate yeah yeah i wanted to ask you did you grow up around this area yeah yeah i was born in moreland road (gasps) where at, at, well, it's now called uh, John Faulkner Hospital. Don't tell me. Oh, it was Sacred, Sacred Heart, Heart Hospital. That's, yeah. was, that's where I was born. Oh, yay. Sweet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Sacred Heart. Yeah, so I was born there and I grew up in uh, actually like Pasco Vale South. Yeah. So like the other side of Melville Road sort of thing. Um, but I went to primary school at St. Fidelis in West Coburg. Oh, wow. I know that very well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On yeah. Phillips Street. No. Uh, Saunders Street. Street. Saunders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That and church I, is still there. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Um, and, um, and like, when I moved out of home, I moved to Brunswick. <laughs> so I made a big move. <laughs> moved to Brunswick. Uh, I had Saturday Greek school at St. Fidelis where you had oh, oh, yes. <laughs> oh, mate. Fucking hell. Uh, um, and then, yeah, I all, like, uh, after I got married, like, we rented a few different streets in, right, like, right near St. Fidelis in West Coburg and then ended up buying a house in Liverpool Street. So, yeah. Where? What? Liverpool Street, which is only a couple of blocks up from um, Saunders Street on yeah, the other side of Yeah, that's Reynard. where I grew up. Yeah, yeah. As a kid, Liverpool Street. Really? Yeah. Fuck, what number? Next door to Marilyn Monroe. That fucking big... Oh, so you were up that end. Yeah, yeah. I was number 12, which is down the other end. Yeah, I'm, I'm next to Marilyn. Oh, wow. Yeah, mum and mum's like, what the fuck have they done? I know. Although it was funny when they did that. If you don't know, they've painted a huge Marilyn Monroe mural on the building adjacent to my parents' house because... Uh, it's Munro Street, which has nothing to do with Marilyn. No, and Monroe. it's spelt different, but yeah. you know, but all, but all the all the old <laughs> dudes, my neighbours Pasquale and Bruno, they were fucking loving that picture going up. Yeah, I, I, I you know, the thing I miss the most about Coburg is right. my old wog neighbours. 
Like, I really miss my old hog neighbours. What a fucking small world. I can't believe you oh, lived that's in amazing. Street. That's why we're both so fucking funny. Yeah. <laughs> Did you know why? Have, one thing I noticed about Liverpool Street, the blocks of land are huge. Yeah. Do you know why? No. I worked it out. Uh, I asked this lady um, who comes to the pokies. She's been living there since day dot. Um, it was uh, bigger lots of land on Liverpool Street allocated to World War One soldiers returning from the war. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, they are. They're really deep blocks. Yeah, they're fabulous. Yeah, it's beautiful. But yeah, I live, uh, I know what you mean about the wogs. Uh, my neighbour across the road makes his own pasta. Yeah. And mum would trade uh, olive oil. We'd get pasta. It was like this barter system with all this yeah, wonderful yeah, yeah, Mediterranean yeah. food. Well, see, I, I used to get all the food, Johnny, with no expectation of anything coming back because yeah. I'm a skip. So yeah. they were like, oh, we don't want your food. <laughs> we just don't want your children to starve. <laughs> You'll love this. My neighbour... On one side, Pasquale and Maria, who were there already when we moved in. Is Pasquale still there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I know him. Oh, you would. Yeah, he knows everyone. Mum's door knocked the whole street. Yeah. Asking him how they're going with AstraZeneca. And I'm like, just fucking take it. <laughs> <laughs> she's door knocking all of them oh, to see if they're still alive. <laughs> Funny, good on her. No, well, pa Pasquale, yeah, no, he's still going. Um, He goes for his walk every day and stuff. <laughs> oh, this is hilarious. It is. Yeah. <laughs> um... But no, um, he was like, yeah, they're just... Is they're... that the concrete front yard with the lemon tree? Yeah, of course. <laughs> when we yeah. bought our house, our house we bought off um, a, a, a Maltese lady named Luigia, who was, um, you know, she, she and her husband had lived there for years. He died um, and she would rented it out and then come back to live in it as a much older person. And then had got to the point her health was really failing and she was going to move in with her daughter in the next street. Mm. Welcome to Coburg, everyone. Yeah. And um, and we got the house for a song and it was like, you know, spotlessly clean but really falling down. It was an old weatherboard place and, you know, because she couldn't do anything on it. It was falling apart. So um, we bought it and Pasquale and Maria were horrified that we didn't bulldoze it and put up a brick place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then when we were finally doing the garden... Pasquale was like, why are you putting in grass? <laughs> like, <laughs> just do what I do. I put in the concrete and I hose it. It's beautiful. Yeah. It's the same as when they got a new kitchen. Maria was so excited. She invited me in to see her new kitchen. It was fucking beautiful, right? I was very envious. And then I'm like, oh, she's a gorgeous cook. Oh, I bet you can't wait to be cooking in this. She goes, oh, no, I cook in the garage. Like, I don't want to don't want to get the kitchen dirty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's beautiful. It's fucking <laughs> insanity. And I lived there <laughs> and I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> we were not allowed to use the inside fridge. We had two toilets, <laughs> the outside toilet and the inside toilet. And you weren't allowed to use the inside toilet. And my dad would be fucking vexed and be like, you know what I found in the fucking inside toilet? I found a shit. And I'm like, where did you want it? Under your pillow? For fuck's sake, dad. He's like, shit outside. And I'm like, this is a home loan ad. Get the fuck out of here. And then, oh, that's beautiful. That's when I was like, I've got to get the fuck out of here. And my brother's like, I'm gone. But yeah, that's them. On a side topic, are you? if I had a fucking bag of money laying around, if I win Tats Lotto, I'm going to make a promise. I want. I would love to bring back the Progress Theatre. Oh yes! How gorgeous was that cinema? I used to Absolutely go there as gorgeous. a kid. Yeah. And just, I watched The Dark Crystal, and then you'd get always get two movies. I'd see Superman, The Sting. I saw some fucking great movies there. Well, if you were clever enough to get in the side gate when I was a kid, you didn't have to pay. It was so really funny. yeah. You could get in the side, like yeah, because the toilets were outside. You had to go out the back to go to the toilets. Yeah, so right. if you were clever enough and you could get over that fence or if they didn't lock the gate properly. And that's what you did. Oh, fuck yeah. And you'd see two movies. Oh, at least. Oh, Sometimes you do two sessions. But you know on the inside, that theatre's restored. It's beautiful still. Is it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it I runs drive as past a ballet school. A ballet school, But on yeah. the outside, it's a bit dilapidated looking. Oh, it's like, fucked. If you see it on the outside, you'd be like, yeah, turn it. Yeah, no, inside no. they've restored it. It's oh, got the they? deco foyer and everything. It's gorgeous. Yeah. So it's a ballet school now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It right. runs as a ballet school. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah. At least it's not run down on the inside. No, no, it's beautiful. Yeah, oh, I love that. Yeah. Oh, man, mm. I miss those. I went to Coburg West Primary School. Did you go? 
No, my kids went to Coburg West Primary School. I went. I got, I got Catholicism enforced upon me, so I went to St. Fidelis. Oh, that's right. Yeah, but oh, my, is that where the nuns were? Uh, well, we had a few nuns at St. Fid's, no, but then I went to like an all-girls Catholic high school, mm. so we had the nuns there. They had the convent in the grounds of the school. They were constantly trying to draw us in, you know, like mm. sign us up when we were 12 and stuff. Did you ever think deeply about the nuns now? Like, what were they? What sort of type of people they were? Like, is uh, well, I found, I found them fascinating in terms of, like, a, even then. Because their devotion cause, fascinates me. Well, that fascinated me, and it was kind of that thing, like, in some ways, when you look at the nuns um, and the way that they live, because, okay, I mean, these days, you know, they're still in convents or sometimes yeah. not. Like, sometimes they're just in, like, a share house and stuff with no boys. But, uh, well, probably no boys. I don't know. But um, they've got each other. It's cool. We know what's going on. Uh, <laughs> why is a choice, really? Um, but um, <laughs> but they've got... Um, but, you know, back in the day, like, they used to farm, you know, like, mm. they used to farm and stuff. So they were like... You know, they'd be fixing the tractor and they'd be, like, mm. running the farm and doing all this other stuff as a group of women, right? Yeah. Which is actually, like, really quite feminist and yes. all that sort of stuff. That's why I was like, did that fascinate But then, yeah, yes, cause... but then on the other hand, they're married to some mythical dude. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah, it's weird. It's so strange. Yeah. Yeah. But I love... Anyway, I'm, I'm, a, I'm attracted to people that are passionate about fucking anything. Yeah. It just cuz I have that passion with stand up. Even though I can't sustain that passion full time, I have peaks and troughs. Yeah, of course. I don't think it's like a marriage or a relation a relationship. You can't be all the time in love with that person no. or all the time in love with stand up. Stand up's going to kick you in the guts a few times and you're yeah, going to yeah. hate it for a while. Yeah. Uh, and that's my message to open mic is like it's you got to play the long game. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think you know you see all the time. We and we can all think about it too. People who've you know come into the scene thinking, oh, you know, in six months I'll be fucking you know headlining rooms and I'll be doing this and doing that, and it's like fucking slow down yeah. and get in line. And and it's also that thing. It's like do the fucking work. Yeah. Like even no matter how talented you are, you still need to do the work. Um, and you also need to, uh, you know, build the relationships. Like, I think, that, I don't know how you feel about this, but for me, it's an interesting thing. Like, uh, comedy is a very individual pursuit in many ways, but it's also actually, unless you're doing a solo show, right, you're part of a team, and the team's only as good as its weakest player. So it's like, um, it does no, you no advantage if someone else in the lineup is shit. You know, you want everyone to be yeah. as good as they can possibly be and you need to support that in whatever ways you can. Mm. And often people don't do that, you know, yeah. just because we're all singly focused on we want to make sure we're good and we want to be, yeah, and which which position am I in on this lineup and, oh, why does that person get this and I don't get this? And it's like, fucking shut up mm. and just actually, you know, you, and it's I think it's also that thing that, it doesn't really need saying, but it, it's that thing about people who are really good at what they do don't need to let other people know. You yeah. know, you just need to do your thing. Do your thing, yeah. You don't need to worry about any of the politics, any of the shit. It's like, just be cool and do your thing. Yeah. That's my approach. Don't, try not to get involved with the politics. Just try and... Yeah, well, you're very, but you're a very do, chill person. Yeah, yeah, do the gig. Try and... Yeah, you, you got to try and crush. I mean, and if you're doing new material, just get it out. Even if it sounds like a TED Talk and you bomb, so be it. Yeah, well, it's it's the thing about what you take away from the bomb, isn't it? And that's the difference, it, you know, is, is when you see somebody. And you know how often it is that we might um, see somebody, like, do something on a Monday that, like, sucks ass mm. and see them do it three or four days later and they've worked it out yeah you know and it's the same stuff yeah. but it's like you're watching a completely different set because yeah, it's, it's like they've put they've put in the thought they've put in the work they've figured out why it didn't work last time and they've you know yeah i have a love hate relationship with that process because i'm a yeah. very uh, believe it or not 
I'm a very withdrawn and shy person off stage. I like to, you know, do private things like go surfing, keep to myself, you know, and then you have to create on stage with all these people watching, you know, they have to look yes. under the bonnet yeah. and you feel very self-conscious about that. And it's like, oh, I wish part of me, sometimes I wish that, um, I could be a chef, I guess, and create in the kitchen. And when it's ready, I'll bring it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand um, what you're saying. Yeah. But they're in there looking at everything we do going, ah, oh, you slipped up there. And that's when I had to fall in love with uh, imperfection and start to really, uh, appreciate a concept called imperfection and just put it out there so much so that uh, what my sister-in-law is trying to get a, uh, a bench top and she's scared she should get a, a sink in mounted or a flush with the surf because she doesn't want it to chip when she puts a pot into yep. it and I'm like so what if it chips you've got a story there it's chipped and as the years go by you'll be like I remember cooking a big pasta sauce and I chipped the fucking stone bench that's that's, I think that's beautiful in a way. I've got a fucking scar on my head from falling downstairs <laughs> in a nightclub. It's, it's there. It's beautiful. I think it's imperfect, but it's, it's a story I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, that, so that's the love-hate relationship I have with the creative process. And yeah. I think some comics, you see them and they refuse to do anything new. They just oh, wanna... yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's that thing, no, you know, no guts, no glory. Like, and that's the truth of it. You know, you know, like it is, it is risky when you do something that's new or something that's different. But then I think too, when you think about people who have long artistic careers in whatever, you know, there are two ways to go. So there's, if you think about, I, I'm a big fan of music of lots of different sorts and someone like Paul Kelly, who I think is fabulous. I know he's not everybody's cup of tea, but there is somebody who continues to you know he can be Paul Kelly and he's written so many fucking hundred songs and he could get up any night of the week and play you know 20 songs and it'd be great and people be like yeah but you know he's done hip-hop stuff he's done jazz stuff you know he's done he's put poetry to music he mm. continues to do things that are different mm. and every one of them is a risk in a way because, you know, he can do something. It doesn't mean they're all going to be fabulous, mm. but it's that thing about continuing to grow and learn and change and do something that's different. And regarding yourself in that capacity, instead of Paul Kelly talking about you, are you similar? Like, do you want to create an hour of material or two hours of material? Do you want to be in a position where you have a hundred people coming to see you more than that? Do you want to have a, where you're just talking through material? Um, I, I have never had sort of, I guess, you... set comedic ambition in a way. I just, you know, I just fucking love it is my reason for sort of keeping going. Do you think we should have an end goal or an aim or do you think that's irrelevant because we're I, artists? I don't, I don't, I don't think it matters. And I think like I will do stand up until such time as I guess nobody wants to book me. <laughs> that's where I am. Um, and that's why I wanted you on my show because that resonates. I, and I'm like, I, I, I can, I can, I want to talk to her because I feel that. Yeah. I feel like we're in this till they say, don't put that bloke on. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And then I'm going to go, you ages cunt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get on the hub and be like, fucking ageism. It's the last ism in comedy. <laughs> fucking, you haven't got an old person on that lineup. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, but I do think, like, I've done, like, I've, I have never done, like, a proper full-on solo show. Like, I've done half-hour shows, but I've never done the hour. And I've actually made the commitment to myself that next comedy festival, yeah, good. I'm doing an hour. But what I'm going to do is, as an hour is probably not what most people would expect me to do as an hour. Like, I've got heaps of material. I, I you know, I love the stage, right? Like, I, I struggle to do a short set now. Like, I find it really hard because I'm just getting up there and it's I feel great. like I'm just getting started. And it's Good like, problem to have. Yeah, it is a good problem to have. Because you like emceeing, don't you? I do like emceeing too. Yeah. Well, I did a lot of it. I was lucky. I did a lot of it when I first, I'd only been doing stand up for maybe six months or something. And I got to run a room, which <laughs> in retrospect, I'm never fucking running a room again. That's bullshit. But I got to emcee <laughs> for like 18 months, like once or twice a week. Yeah. Which, which you, gets you, you good. Because when you break it down, it's, 
How many acts are on? Six, seven? That's six, seven open spots you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You jump up, you get them, bring on an act. But it's also that thing too. I, I emceed at a venue that was often in chaos in terms of the tech didn't work or someone hadn't turned up yet or well, how good stuff that? happened. So it's like you you got to fill in for people and you've got to, you know, and you've got to keep it t- 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 like this, right? And it taught me, t- 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 like I'm quick. Usually yes. I'm quick. And so, and I enjoy being quick. Like I quite mm. like that as a skill to have. Mm. Um, and the other thing is too, commercially, you know, I mean, I'm not a professional comic, but I've, um, you know, I've emceed like lots of other stuff that's not comedy, but yeah, that right. t- 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 skill. And you make really good money out of that. You know, if you if you want to do if you want to develop your skills to actually be able to earn some decent money on a regular basis, being able to MC, a lot of people don't realise how much skill is involved in MCing. MCing. They think anybody can do it, and it's not true. Not only do you have to worry about your material, but you have to take st- uh, you have to take a pulse of the room. Yeah. At, after every single act, so your sensory perception has to be wider. So not only you're focusing on your development, you're focusing on the running of the show's development, and you're just building up this extra uh, skill set. Yeah, right? yeah. So and that's why really... I think maybe that's attributed to how you can. I've seen you a couple of times just rain in a whole room and refocus them all towards you. And yeah, is that just learning to the craft of emceeing over eighteen months? I guess so. I don't know, but uh, but I have to say. Um, one of the one of the um, things I had I'm not going to say advantage necessarily, but when I started doing stand up was I'd spent years um, working in the community sector with no resources, where we would run conferences and other events, or we'd be running uh, f- like facilitating group programs for a whole bunch of people that didn't want to be there and didn't want to talk to anyone and whatever else, and I had to draw them in and get them engaged and try and get them participating, right? So I had been doing all of that for a very long time, not on a stage with a microphone necessarily, although sometimes on a stage with a microphone when you're at a conference or something. But so that actual incredible self-consciousness that I think most people naturally feel when you start doing stand-up about having everyone looking at you and waiting to hear what's coming out of your mouth and you know, reacting to that or not reacting to that and all that sort of panic you have about, you know, what if I get up there? I didn't have the fear of that. I had other fears about doing stand-up. Hmm. Like, my fear was that no one would laugh, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. you know, that I'd suck. Like, I had the fear of sucking, of course, Yeah. but I didn't have that just general uncomfortableness with being in front of a group of people who didn't know me at all and Yay. maybe didn't want to be there and all that stuff. It was like, that didn't phase me. So that was maybe a little bit of a lucky thing for me maybe i don't know uh, i don't MC. i just yeah if, and fair enough don't like it i just yeah. don't want to go to that i don't yeah it's like a dentist i'll take the paper on teeth i don't want i'm not interested in the rest um just don't want to learn to do it but um brad brad oaks told me something about how he realized he was a competent MC. and if i'm not saying it right brad i apologize but something along the lines of he was at the comics lounge and he was doing a uh, MCing the night and in the break, um, a patron came up to him and said, uh, there's no toilet paper. And he felt great and humbled by that because he was like, he relaxed the audience so much that they felt that they could just come up, yeah, and let him know rather than go to the bar or yeah, look. Yeah, wow, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I get it. You're like making everyone relax and tell everyone that, yeah. hey, I'm, you know, I'm. You're, yeah, it's I'm, like it's his space. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It was really cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, anyway, we've been chatting. Um, we got to go. Do you want to plug anything? Uh, oh, look, I'm, d- I'm doing, I'm doing Cooper's on Friday night. Come, it's an epic show. Tomorrow, which, but we, we won't, yeah, oh. this will go out next Tuesday. Oh, okay. All when right. Well, doing Cooper's? Oh, I'm doing Cooper's on Friday of this week, but actually on the 18th of August, I'm doing the Crab Lab show at Comedy Republic, which will be fucking epic. Yay. Yay. Yay me. It's like... The old Crab Lab was my favourite room in Melbourne. Yeah. I yeah, miss it very much, but the show will be fantastic. So, All yeah, right. grab a ticket and come along. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki Barry. Thank you so much. See ya. Bye.